All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for this ethics uh, in sports medicine panel discussion. Uh, we're very happy to have you. Uh, we are uh, putting this on as a uh, presentation from the AMSSM um, Education Committee, of which uh, I am a part. We are part of the um, Fellows Online Education Subcommittee. This is one of our capstone presentations for this academic year, and uh, we will be um, uh, soon. Uh, our final lecture will be coming up next week. Um, uh, as you can see here, Dr. Suzanne Hecht will be speaking to us on Monday, June 7th. This will be our last lecture for this academic year. She'll be talking on menstrual disorders in athletes. Tonight, we have a very exciting panel. Uh, before we get into that, I wanna give you just a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you've tuned into these before, you've heard this, um, but uh, just so that we can uh, touch base. Uh, this content is served, it, it's intended to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs um, educational uh, curriculum and uh, not to replace it. Uh, our goal is to assist fellows with preparing for your CAQ exam. And uh, to do that, we try to provide access to some of our nation's top experts, um, mostly AMSSM members and a few guest experts from around the country uh, it, through these lectures and discussions and in a variety of formats. And uh, all of these lectures will be uh, recorded and are available through the AMSSM YouTube channel for viewing at your convenience. And we encourage you to go online and review those um, at any time. And uh, at this time, if you're not speaking, um, it ask you to mute your microphone and, and keep your video camera off. Please do submit questions through the chat function. Uh, as we go through the discussion, uh, we love to hear and see what you're thinking. And uh, as those comments and questions are rolling in, I'll be moderating those. And as we get to the end, uh, we'll have a discussion where we can uh, direct some of those comments and questions to our panelists. And uh, we'll be reserving about the last 10 minutes of this hour long presentation for that purpose. Uh, so please do keep the questions coming in. Um, at the end of the panel discussion, you'll be receiving a link with a, uh, an evaluation, which we would really appreciate if you would complete. That gives us very good feedback and we really do look at that and, and take that into account. So uh, without further ado, uh, tonight we'll be having an ethics discussion uh, where we will feature six, um, six people. Well, five uh, panelists uh, will uh, uh, then go into um, a question and answer at the very end. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panel. Our, uh, our first panelist is Dr. Kate Ackerman. Uh, Dr. Ackerman is an internist uh, who is dual fellowship trained in sports medicine and endocrinology. Uh, she is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard uh, where she also serves as the director of the female athlete program and serves as course director for the female athlete conference. Uh, she is a former national team lightweight rower and she now serves as a team physician for US rowing. Our, uh, our second panelist uh, is Dr. Denise Dudzinski. Uh, she is professor and chair of the Depart Department of Bioethics and Humanities um, at the University of Washington. Uh, she kindly joins us today um, at the recommendation of um, Dr. Ashwin Rao. And uh, Dr. Dudzinski is um, an adjunct professor in the School of Law and the Department of Hum uh, Family Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Washington. She's certified in healthcare ethics consultation um, through the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. Uh, she's chief of the UW uh, Medicine and Ethics uh, Consultation Service. And um, she lectures for uh, Dr. Rao uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Harmon's fellowship up at, at UW. So uh, she is experienced with sports medicine ethics as well, to, to at least some degree. Um, she's very humble and we were pleased to have her. Um, Dr. Sedgley um, is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna uh, step back once. Uh, Dr. Amadeus Mason is an assistant professor in uh, the Department of Orthopedics and Family Medicine at uh, Emory School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Mason is a team physician at Georgia Tech, uh, track and field and cross country. Uh, he is a team physician for USA Track and Field. 
and uh, he has served um, in the past as chief medical officer for USA Track and Field at the Summer Olympic Games in Rio. Uh, most recently, Dr. Mason assumed uh, the position of medical director for the Atlanta Track uh, Club Elite Athlete Program and is co-director for Emory's uh, Running Medicine Program. Uh, moving, uh, moving forward, Dr. Sedgley is a uh, sports medicine physician at MedStar here in Baltimore, uh, where he serves as co-director of, or I'm sorry, director of the running medicine uh, program and, and director of emergency action planning as well. Uh, he is a team physician for the Baltimore Orioles. Um, he directs the Baltimore Running Festival. Uh, he's a team physician for uh, multiple uh, community colleges and um, including the uh, Howard County Community College and uh, the Coppin State University. He is a consultant for the NFL uh, team, the Baltimore Ravens, and he's directed multiple marathons and ultra marathons. Dr. Jeff Tanji is someone who uh, probably uh, everyone, if, or almost everyone is aware of. Uh, Dr. Tanji is a founder and past president of AMSSM. He currently serves um, as a sports medicine physician at uh, UC Davis. Uh, medical center. He was previously the co-director of sports medicine, and um, he has uh, graciously uh, agreed to join us on our panel tonight. And uh, he has served in the past on multiple AMSSM task forces, uh, recently uh, co-authored the AMSSM um, position statement on sexual violence in sport. Uh, he's been a team physician for multiple uh, professional and collegiate sports teams as well. Um, just a quick um, intro. I am uh, Dr. Nate Nye. I am an active duty Air Force uh, physician, sports medicine, family medicine, um, and I am the assistant program director here at the, uh, the military's uh, fellowship program in the DC area, where I get the pleasure to work with many of our young fellows and, um, and Dr. Sedgley, um, among other multiple faculty, which is um, a great honor. So, we are going to, without further ado, uh, get started with our, our panel discussion for this evening. Uh, some of the topics that we're going to be talking about um, under the umbrella of ethics in sports medicine um, include uh, some of the conflicts of interest that we come across uh, in the field of sports medicine. Um, we may or may not have time to get into confidentiality issues. And lastly, uh, we are going to discuss issues related to gender. In particular, we're going to talk about um, regulation versus non-regulation of hyperandrogenism, in, uh, particularly in, in females, female athletes. So um, again, without further ado, I'm going to be um, kicking off and moderating most of this discussion. It is a discussion, not a lecture. Um, so. Uh, to begin with, what is uh, ethics? Ethics really means uh, doing the right thing. And uh, the study of ethics is really the study of what makes a particular course of action the right one in a particular circumstance. Uh, sports medicine is uh, rather unique in that it brings uh, the physician into a unique relationship with a patient where the patient in the context of a team is trying to win. Um, and to compete against other athletes. Uh, and oftentimes that, that changes the doctor-patient relationship and, uh, and brings in a third element, which is the team. And uh, so that's uh, something that we uniquely face in sports medicine. And uh, as we, you know, as times continue to evolve and change, there's always new and, and challenging situations where we as leaders of of medical care of our athletes uh, need to be prepared to make the right decisions, tough calls many times. So we're gonna be talking about many of those things. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna kick off with a case. Um, we're gonna set ourselves in the context of a high school football game. Uh, you're on the sideline with your team. Um, it's a playoff game. Your team is down by three and the star quarterback, uh, will say uh, his name is Bobby. He gets blindsided. He gets uh, just pummeled and uh, gets knocked to the ground. He seems to be a little slow to get up. Um, he's uh, called to the sideline and you're doing an evaluation along with the athletic trainer. Uh, you guys do a SCAT-5 exam and uh, you notice that his 
short-term memory seems a little bit off, um, but his physical exam is, uh, is mostly normal, maybe a little bit off balance, but um, his neuro exam is intact. Um, he's anxious to get back in the game. Uh, again, we're down by three and uh, the coaches would love to put him back in the game and finish off this drive. Uh, we're faced with a tough decision. Um, so I would like to open it up to our panel and, um, you know, what do you do in this situation? And uh, what's the right thing to do and, and what makes it hard? And um, why don't I go ahead and, uh, and toss this one to Dr. Sedgley because I know he's um, dealt with this. Thanks, Nate. <clears throat> I appreciate it. Um, I think if you haven't you know, been in a situation like this, you will be. Um, as my mentor, Dr. Tucker says, there's, there's not a lot of confidentiality when you've got 20,000 people watching you do your job. And so, you know, as we talk about ethics, I, you know, I think sports medicine is one of the most confidentially challenged situations. You know, as a family medicine doctor, when you initially train, you're, you're in a private room and it's just you and the patient and maybe you're counseling them on, you know, healthy, you know, living, maybe with their blood pressure or something, there's no one else there. In this, in this particular setting, uh, you're going to find, you know, everyone's got an opinion and they're screaming it at you and you've got to do the right thing for that patient. Um, it's, you know, beyond the scope of this particular talk, but obviously I think somewhere along the line at this point in the fellowship, most people have learned about second impact syndrome. And so, you know, you, your first job is you're the doctor for that student athlete, uh, or maybe just an athlete. I didn't hear whether it was a high school or, or pro, but you know, you got to do the right thing, like you said at the top of this uh, introduction. Uh, and, you know, the reality is that everyone's, you know, going to be watching. This is, I think, why, you know, certain situations, they'll actually have a little tent. You can go in and actually do the assessment, which is nice. But I think I'd throw the first thing out there is, number one, uh, it's a confidentiality uh, nightmare and that everyone's watching you. So it's a little bit different than what you may be used to. Uh, but the second thing is you must, as you said, do the right thing for the patient. And, you know, you know that if they are concussed and they go back in and get concussed again, that can be very bad for your patient. That can be catastrophic. Um, and so, you know, you're going to have external forces, you know, you know, is that just a traumatic headache doc? You know, let's get them back in there. You know, we're in field goal range. You know, it doesn't matter if you're in field goal range or not when you're doing an assessment. Um, your job is as the team physician to do an assessment and, you know, you may have to explain to that athlete because that athlete's also playing a game of chess. They, they know how it works. Uh, they're very familiar with what happens, you know, if there's a concussion diagnosis and, you know, you have to have a really good relationship, I think, with that athlete too, to be able to communicate to them. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that obviously you want to be able to do you know, a very good standard workup uh, on the concussion. But in the end, what makes this situation, I think, on the ethics discussion is it's not knowing what to do, because I think we, we know where this is heading uh, for this particular situation. But you've got to be able to communicate and say, you know, for the safety of this athlete, you know, we need to perhaps do some more testing where it's more quiet. If you really don't know if their balance is off, you know, maybe you have a baseline in this situation. Or maybe there's some additional tests that you can run, you know, in just a, a quick, you know, a few minutes to try to determine, you know, are your suspicions true? Well, you know if I, I don't want to talk too much over some, some of my great panelists here, but those are some first thoughts. Appreciate that. Um, Dr. Tanji, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. What makes this hard? And maybe you could uh, talk about, uh, you know, what makes it different in a high school setting versus like in a professional athlete setting? Great, great question, Nate. Um, <clears throat> in, in our state, in California, one thing that makes our job easy as team physicians is that at any level, if you suspect a concussion, the player can't return to the game. And they set up this law, and I think it, it's a law that holds in m most of the states, if not all the states in the US, is to particularly take the pressure off the coach or the athletic trainer or the team physician mm -hmm. there. So it's really clear cut that if you have someone who's dizzy, they're, they're in balance, uh, there's a lack of balance, the memory is impaired, you have a suspected concussion, you can't return to the game. 
Now, this really should hold at any level of sport. So, so if you push this forward to Dr. Tucker's level, NFL team position, some, some positions might say the higher the level you give informed consent in your decision making. But again, there are external observers at the NFL level who are not related to either team who will make a decision about reviewing the case whether or not an athlete can return. So these days, fortunately, concussion suspected diagnosis um, becomes easier because of laws. Now, it, it may be in fact that my colleagues will wanna address this, What's legal is not necessarily what's ethical. Those are two separate questions. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's twist the question just a little bit. And, um, you know, what if you have an athlete who is, uh, is injured? We'll say it's not a concussion. And I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Ackerman. Uh, let's uh, tee this one up for you. So you've got an athlete who... Um, is recovering from a musculoskeletal injury, say it's a sprained ankle. And uh, let's even say that you've heard this athlete talking about uh, their symptoms um, in the locker room. Maybe they didn't know you were listening. Um, and then they're coming to you before game time and saying they're good to go. And uh, they're ready to, you know, they're hundred percent. And, um, you know, what, so an athlete who's under reporting symptoms, um, what's your duty to the the player versus to the team. And so what's, what's the right thing to do? And one of the things, I think these things are sometimes more subtle than we wanna make it, you know, black and white. Obviously we wanna take care of the patient. We wanna counsel the patient to make sure that they're taking their health seriously. We have to weigh the severity of their injury and what we think could be like the most catastrophic outcome. And we also have to consider the level of play, you know, we might be much more strict with a an elementary school athlete than a pro athlete at the final, you know, quarter in the Super Bowl. So ultimately, though, we want to counsel the athlete and say, you know, maybe you can test them a little bit and just see how they're walking. Typically, if they do have pain, they're going to have a little bit of a gait or something that's going to give away the issues so that you don't have to say, hey, I was eavesdropping, but you can basically do a little bit of a physical, you know, play street doctor and look how they're walking and, and then kind of open the discussion and basically say, I noticed this about you. Tell me what you're thinking. I'm thinking you look like you could potentially have this type of injury. Just talking forward, these are your options. These are the risks. These are the benefits. And if it's an adult, they're able to make their own decision. If it's a kid, it's sort of a different story because you have this obligation and you need to be talking to the parents and bringing them into the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, um, Dr. Mason, what are your thoughts? What do you, What if you have a professional athlete versus a, a, a youth athlete who's uh, just super driven and... Um, you know, what, what considerations do you have to take into account with, uh, with these, uh, you know, a young, a young player versus, uh, you know, a seasoned adult athlete at different levels of play? Somebody who's got an injury or maybe under reporting or, um, you know, is returning to, you know, feeling ready to return to play, but you, maybe you don't think so. Maybe you don't think so. Amadeus, are you on mute? I think we've got him on mute. Um, so, um, can you hear me? There yeah. we go. Yeah, okay. there right. it is. Thank you. I, I had the wrong microphone selected. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't um, treat necessarily treat a professional different than I would a, a high school athlete. My approach would be or my consideration would be are they functional can they do the task that they are um, going to be required to do and um, uh, as Kate was talking about doing a functional test and using that to be my um, uh, determining factor as to whether or not what they were saying or complaining about is manifesting in their ability to do what they're going to be asked to do. Um, and knowing, fortunately, um, if you're in a uh, professional setting or a high school setting where you're the team physician, you will have a, um, hopefully have a relationship with the athlete and you'll be able to uh, get an understanding of uh, where 
or what they are capable of or where their mindset is. Uh, and that does play into it as well, knowing and understanding what the athlete is truly um, uh, capable of from a discussion standpoint or vocalization standpoint and a functionality standpoint, how those two things do or don't interact. Do you think it matters or plays into the decision making like the dollar figure that's associated with an athlete's career? Maybe it's to their own, like a contract that they are hoping to get with the team next year or um, the longevity of their career. Maybe it's a pitcher who's, you know, got a little bit of soreness and they're, you know, pretty worried about their, their elbow um, versus it's a, you know, you know, somebody who doesn't have a lot of, a large dollar figure writing on that decision. If, if you're, when you're talking about a professional like that, it's a, then a conversation. It's saying, okay, can, to me, again, functionality is going to be the, the thing that determines my recommendation. And then I say, okay, are you able to function uh, at the level that we are expecting you to, or that they are expecting you to um, uh, function? If that is, uh, if they're capable of doing that, but they are having a pain or having to fight through, then it is a conversation about, okay, this is my recommendation as an adult and um, uh, a person who is thinking about your uh, income and how you are going to um, uh, negotiate that next contract. Is this a um, risk that you are willing to take? We go through and have that conversation and Ultimately, it's going to be, they're going to have to, as an adult, follow what they are comfortable with. We can give recommendations, or I can give recommendations, but um, it would be a conversation that I would have at that point. Right. Awesome. So I'm going to uh, steer in a little bit of a different direction here. Um, what if we've got um, a player who's been dealing with some ankle soreness? We'll keep it with the ankle. And um, he's asking you for a shot. You know, he wants some Toradol uh, so he can get back in the game because he, he gets a shot every game before the week, uh, before the, every week before the game. Um, and uh, so is that the right thing to do? Dr. Sedgley, what do you say? So I think, you know, um, certainly we always, you know, take a step back and, you know, if someone was to come into the training room and say, hey, you know, I love my usual, uh, you know, Toradol, um, I'll sometimes just step back and, you know, they have agency over their body. This is, this is their body. You know, if you want to, you know, make it a professional athlete or not, doesn't matter. They, they can, you know, request, you know, help. That's what they're doing. And I'll sometimes sit back and be like, hey, did, you know, did you see the surgeon last week? Who gave you the shot? Was that me? Let me pull up your notes and we, everyone's got their EMR and I'll, you know, sometimes I'll just for my own edification, I'll say, and, and this is the medicine where we do the blood test, you know, check your kidney liver function, you know, every so often, correct? Uh, you know, and, and it, it's not so much, you know, I'm not playing uh, you know, that I'm dumb, but I just, it's for me to verbalize to them the, the process that I'm going through in my mind. And a lot of times, you know, it's good because they'll be like, oh, is that, is that why we do that blood work? I'm like, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's broken down by the kidney, but it's gotten rid of by the liver. And it, if you get too much of it, we got to be careful. It's just like too much of anything. And I think like uh, Dr. Mason was saying, you want to have a relationship where the patient feels you're on their side, you're educating, you're giving them options. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we do this all the time anyway. If, if we have a, a runner who has high blood pressure, we're like, well, here's, here's some options for you. Um, Certain one of these blood pressures, you may not want to have a beta blocker. It's not going to help your performance. Uh, you know, other times, you know, this one is more preferred. I, I think when you're talking about with a Toradol shot, you know, it's something that we know we could give them safely, but sometimes I'll just walk through like, okay, and is this that, did we ever get an x-ray or MRI or something? Like, I want to make sure I know what I'm treating. I know what I'm treating, you know, with what the indication is. And then, you know, I'll, I'll ask them do you have any questions? And, uh, you know, we talk about professional athletes, you know, having money and such, but sometimes they're the most vulnerable patients you'll treat. 
Um, Cause everyone's coming to them with ideas. And as they're a team physician, you know, you want to give them good advice. So I mean, that's how I would approach it. Um, you know, certainly I think that, you know, that way it gives them the opportunity to, to know why we're doing what we're doing. That's important. I mean, you know, a year ago we saw someone who didn't have any agency of their life with the George Floyd uh, occur. And I think that that's spurred us as a society to say, this is not right. Um, so it's a little microcosm, but when you're with that patient, I try to think of how can I help this person? I just take everything else aside and that's how I would approach it. That's, that's awesome. Um, I would like to uh, tee one up for Dr. Tanji and then Denise, I have a question for you right after that. Um, so Dr. Tanji, when is it, when is uh, treating pain, when does it go too far? Uh, with an athlete. And, you know, Dr. Sedgley pointed out some, you know, key points on how to do it right, um, such as, you know, educating the patient um, as, a, as a key foundation for that. But when, when do we get into uh, hot water and when are we going too far? Yeah, great question, Nate. And, and I'm going to actually <clears throat> recall some history that puts this in perspective. E even before the opioid crisis, it was pretty much the convention of sports medicine that we wouldn't give an athlete or competitive uh, performer a narcotic prior to an event that had pain. So in, from, from that convention, it made our jobs very easy in that rarely an athlete would come asking for a narcotic and we would say, it's just something that's not done. It has CNS effects that will affect your reaction time. Uh, we, we just don't do that. So sort of set that aside. That's, that's one aspect. Um, it was a famous lawsuit back in the 1960s. San Francisco 49er defensive lineman, all pro Charlie Kruger, received 36 cortisone injections in a 12 game season for his arthritic knees before, at halftime, and after the game. Uh, needless to say, at that point, there weren't really guidelines for how much cortisone was too much, but obviously it was too much, and he won a multi million dollar lawsuit against the 49ers team physician in the 1960s. So we became very careful about injection therapies prior to competition um, on the basis of that lawsuit. So again, I would, I would go back to uh, Amadeus's um, dic dictum of function, that it's an individual decision. It's based on the function of an athlete. I agree with Dr. Sedgley, we have to be clear in the diagnosis, so we're not just treating pain. So if an athlete's hurting, we're not gonna say, okay, I have to give you something for pain so you can compete. Uh, because there's pain that's related to injury and incapacity, and then there's pain that's just pain. And it's very hard to make that decision unless you know the patient, you know the patient's background and their diagnosis. Awesome. Very well said. Thank you so much. Um, Denise, I would like to, uh, to ask you to give your thoughts on, you know, we, we've had multiple uh, discussions about um, what are conflicts of interest, and I've uh, try to bring up some issues with re regard to uh, timing of return to play, um, you know, athletes concealing symptoms, um, and uh, how do we treat pain uh, in, in athletes. But uh, what are these, how do you see these issues with uh, conflicts of interest and uh, for sports medicine physicians? And you also have brought up a topic of what are conflicting interests and how is that different than a conflict of interest? and uh, dual relationships. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so thank you. It's, it's inspiring and nice to hear um, um, such thoughtful clinicians um, thinking about all the athletes that they care for. Um, and, and these responses really, really reflect a lot of integrity, which is really what you want to have in each individual case. There are a lot of factors that each clinician has to take into account and you want somebody who's acting with, with as much integrity as possible. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. Um, so <clears throat> conflicts of, there are several different things that are sort of clustered together. So there's a conflict of, conflict of interest in which basically somebody's in a situation like a physician who has a private or personal interest that's in conflict with their um, professional interest. So, that includes something like keeping your job, right? Right. So that's a private interest, even though it has a professional sort of character that may be in conflict with something like, you know, I don't know, you know, um, advancing the best interest of the patient in one way or the other, or at abiding by their autonomous requests. So these 
things can come up for any of us in fiduciary relationships, which fiduciary sort of just means it, relationships that are built on a special kind of trust. So that's certainly clinicians, it's also bankers, it's lawyers, all of these kinds of people have fiduciary relationships with the people they work with. So what you're looking for there is, is one interest interfering or could be perceived, reasonably perceived by an onlooker as interfering with another interest. This is different than something like, it's like a, a, a more advanced form or a more acute circumstance of conflicting interests. All of us have conflicting interests all the time, competing professional interests, professional and personal. I need to get home to my daughter's soccer game, but this patient really needs me right now. Those are genuine interests of the clinician that, and they have to make decisions. And then that happens within the clinical realm as well, the professional realm as well. So we're all negotiating those. And that requires some, both of these require some um, ethical savvy to try to negotiate through and work through. Often with conflicts of interest, we talk a lot about disclosure. So saying, let's say there's a, there's a monetary interest that somebody may have. If you disclose these things, this is a way of, of sort of mitigating the conflict. But we've learned through a lot of um, uh, studies actually that the, the, the disclosure of a conflict actually doesn't mitigate it very much. Um, so that's really interesting. So it requires some other more thoughtful um, negotiation when it comes to uh, conflict of interest, but beyond disclosure. Then there's another thing that's relevant here, I think, which is dual relationships. And when I hear you guys talk, because um, I mostly work outside of sports medicine, so I'm learning from all of you today as well, um, is that in some ways, all of you, by the nature of the job that you have, have a dual relationship. One is this relationship clinical relationship with your patient and the other is with the team and you're both at the same time. And not all clinicians have to negotiate that the way you guys do day in and day out versus somebody who might have a dual relationship where they're a doctor and now their sister comes up to them and says, look at this mole, right? Tell me what's going on with this mole. That's a dual relation. How am I supposed to react to this? Am I supposed to be a doctor here? And if I'm a doctor, am I a good sister? And you have to go back and forth. So those are the kinds of dual relationships I often talk about. But you're, what you guys face is much more complicated. And I guess I wonder how, what you guys think about that dual relationship. I'm not going to get in your way, Nate, with your questions. But that's fascinating to me because it's unique. No, I love that. That's a great question. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to toss that one back up to the panel and I'll leave this to whoever wants to swing at it is what do you think of these dual relationships? How do you make heads or tails and how do you balance them? Athlete versus team versus other potential interests or relationships. I mean, they're definitely sticky, but, um, I, I think I try to get everybody to disclose as much as they can. Um, so that won't always work, but let's say you have, I'll use a rower as an example, as a doctor for US rowing. If I have a rower who has a back injury and they don't want to tell, they don't want me to tell the national team coach because they're afraid they're not gonna be put in the boat if the coach knows that they're injured. Ultimately, that if they're that injured that they're not going to do a good job, it doesn't, it doesn't help their situation to hide this injury anyway. Like it will come out. And so often by just talking through it and disclosing early on and getting the athlete to be the one to disclose and getting this person into rehab and modifying the training, they still have a chance to make that boat faster. Um, if we catch it early, if we modify the training, and if we know that it's not really punitive to take a little time off to do cross training and stay fit. I think when you start to get in the more complicated situations, it's when you have, you have no control over the coach and their personality and maybe the selection is really harsh. And so there, you can't pretend to the athlete that there won't be some sort of negative consequence. And those situations are really tough. Um, but if you have a good working relationship with the coach and the coach is a reasonable person and you have a good working relationship with the athlete, very often we can get injured athletes to a better place to peak at the right time. But things need to be aligned and people all need to be reasonable and trusting of one another. How would, does any, has anyone had an experience where um, it felt like um, they were at odds? Like, 
what other thoughts do you guys have? Matt, have you been in a situation like that where maybe with the Ravens or the Orioles, maybe, maybe I shouldn't throw teams under in the limelight, but, um, you know, never with the Ravens or Orioles. No, never. Um, so <laughs> I, you know, I will actually talk about one instance at the collegiate level. We had actually a, a very fierce outside hitter for a volleyball team and, uh, she became pregnant. And, uh, you know, she did not want the coach to know. And that was because her perceived persona was this, you know, vicious outside hitter. She did not want to be seen as um, by the coach or by anyone else um, in any other way. And so it wasn't affecting her. Uh, You know, we did a literature search and we said, look, you know, we're going to co-manage you with OBGYN. You know, we're going to have you know, uh, some letters of, you know, support, you know, from some experts. Uh, but it was a situation where, you know, a player had a medical condition where, you know, maybe she'll dive on the ground. Maybe that's not good for the pregnancy. There's just, there wasn't a lot of publications at the time. Um, and so, you know, we had to, you know, keep, you know, her confidence that we were not going to tell the coach. We also wanted to make sure that we had the best interest of both her and her child, uh, you know, forefront. And so you end up, you know, I think the, the ethicist was talking about, you you just have, you're juggling a lot of different, you know, roles and you want to do the right thing for the patient in front of you. uh, And, you know, generally secrets are bad. You don't want secrets, but at the same time, if someone says, look, I don't want anyone to know it's not really didn't affect the coach's ability to coach. You know, he didn't need to know she was pregnant. Um, so we've had some interesting situations um, where, you know, I think if you, again, I just always told the, the athlete, look, I work for you. And, and they know that, you know, like there, there's this dual agency. They're very aware of it at most levels. Um, but I say, look, I want to do what's best for you. And, and sometimes that means asking them questions. You know, what do you want out of this? What's your priority? And then that gives you the chance to say, well, I really want to make sure that, you know, baby's healthy. Can we make sure that If the GOM wants to see you at this rate or at this frequency, we do that. No one needs to know. We're not going to tell the coach. But, you know, maybe I talk to the patient and say the university probably for legal reasons, you know, we don't have to tell the coach, but maybe through the AD we can have something, you know, like, do you want me to just vaguely ask about, you know, what do we do about pregnancies? You can advocate for a patient with good confidentiality. And that takes some sensitivity. You have to be able to communicate well, not only to the patient, but, you know, just say, look, if I had a you know, pregnant patient, I want to like, she does not want it to be known, you know, hypothetically, what would we do there? You can ask hypotheticals and get information from other folks to get their feeling on it without saying, you know, Matt Sedgley has melanoma, you know, like you, you know, come take a look at my, you know, this mole on my face at the party. Um, and I think that that really takes an emotional level of, of talent, um, and so that's just my thoughts on it. You know, it's, it's difficult. It's not easy, but I think, you know, it takes a little bit more capacity just to say, look, I, I work for you. And I think that goes a long way when you're talking to the athlete. Yeah. yeah. Kate and Matt, thank you. That was uh, excellent. Uh, I appreciate those comments. Amadeus, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to add, um, I was going to add, I think both Matt and Kate uh, were, what they were articulating is, we have to communicate. Um, that duality is we have to be very good at communicating. And as you communicate, um, uh, it's not just what we are getting out and giving to the patient or to the university. It's figuring out what they are wanting as well and translating that between university and uh, the athlete, the athlete and the university, and being a really good go-between and that that duality that you say is we're like a conduit it's trying to make sure that we're staying with our communication receiving communication filtering it understanding it and then putting it back out where it needs to go that's beautiful well said i um i think that's a great place for us to change gears here and um, with with what time we have remaining i'd like to go ahead and start talking about some issues with um, hyperandrogenism in in sports and um, Dr. Tanji, you seem to be um, you know hitting home runs with every hard question that I ask you and um, 
I'm going to ask you to, to do that again. Uh, why is this difficult? You know, what, what is it? Can you uh, summarize and just um, kind of set the table, I guess, before we dive into more specifics? Why is this issue so challenging with, um, you know, women and hyperandrogenism? I'm going to just make one or two sentences and then yield my time to this okay. because he knows a lot more about this than I do. <laughs> I think it runs the very complicated relationship of identity, who, who we are, and being a participant in a competition, who we are and how we compete, and how that ties together with advantages, disadvantages, rules, uh, what's fair, what's not fair. And you put all of that together. And it is not only a difficult challenge for, um, for sports medicine physicians, it's a difficult challenge for people that make rules for sport. And with that, I'm gonna yield my time. Okay. Um, so I know um, all of you have lots to say on this. Um, Amadeus, I'd like to ask you a couple of things and then Kate, I'd like to get your thoughts as well, for sure. Um, Amadeus, uh, can you tell us, maybe set, help us, uh, you know, dive a little deeper. What are the things that um, maybe talk about endogenous conditions, um, intrinsic conditions that give, uh, that may lead to hyperandrogenism? And how is that different than, you know, someone who's exogenously receiving some androgens? Uh, yeah, I, I would... Um... I think I'm going to pull a, a Jeff Tanji and <laughs> punt to Your Dr. Ackerman because I can give that very good um, explanation, but <laughs> truly <laughs> she will be able to do a much better job of that than okay. me. I can on the back end talk about the thought processes of the competition and fairness mm -hmm. and what goes behind that from a governing body standpoint. Okay. That that definitely I can speak to. We'll take you up on that. Okay, you're up, Kate. So I'm going to yield the floor. No, I'm just kidding. I'll <laughs> answer this one. <laughs> so first of all, there's, there's two separate issues and they often get lumped together and they could each take a lot of time. So I'm going to start off the bat with saying, I'm going to plug our female athlete conference because we're going to spend a lot of time with this topic at our female athlete conference, femaleathletconference.com. So basically you have people who are DSD, differences in sexual development, and then you have people who are transgender. These are two separate topics, but both have issues about hyperandrogenism or elevated testosterone compared to cisgender women or women without DSD. So the biggest issue is about competing in female sports. And certainly you can have people in DSD category, you know, DSD who compete in male sports. You could have people with DSD or, or who are transgender who compete in male sports, but that's not what everybody gets excited about. It's about the female cath category. So we'll start with um, hyperandrogenism and DSD. So a perfect case of that is Castor Semenya. That's probably one of the most famous cases. And so Castor is somebody who is DSD. She has XY chromosomes, but she has some sort of um, androgen insensitivity or some sort of uh, issue that she's not getting full testosterone. She didn't develop completely as male. And so she was raised as female, identifies as female. And it, this all came to a head when she was competing in 2009. And all of a sudden she beat so many people. And so that kind of put her on the world stage as a really young athlete. And people all had suspicions because she looked different. She crushed the competition. And so since that time, she has competed in the Olympics. She's been a, a topic of discussion um, because people are wondering, does she have more testosterone levels? Does she have a higher level of testosterone than a typical XX female? Um, and so again, getting back to Jeff's point, you know, what is our discussion and what are, where are we lying in, in terms of ethics and in terms of humanity versus pure science and strict categories? So even if we have some science to back up, okay, testosterone gives you an advantage. We also need to decide how we're treating people with testosterone. You know, is by definition Castor not a female or is she a female because she was raised female, she identifies as female, she didn't develop into a full-blown man and, and she's, we're going by self-identity and gender expression. 
So there's no question that testosterone gives you an athletic advantage. It makes people more powerful. They have a higher hemoglobin level. Testosterone during development causes a greater muscle mass if it's trained. So if you're weightlifting and doing all sorts of training and you have testosterone in your system, you're gonna get much more benefit from that. You know, if you are getting this testosterone in your system during development, you'll be taller, you'll be stronger. And so there's no question there's an advantage, but the, the ethical question that comes down to world athletics and so many other sports is should someone like Castor who was naturally born this way have to suppress that level and so currently the world athletics ruling is yes she needs to keep her get her level much closer um, to what the average woman would be so we might be an average woman might be you know 1.7 uh, for a level of testosterone and world athletics is saying we need to get Castor's level and anybody who has DSD below five five or you know, lower than five in order to compete and it needs to be there for six months and then stay that level or below throughout comp competing. Um, and I'll have Amadeus interrupt me in a second to tell me what World Athletics is doing. The other topic though is transgender. And transgender is somebody who is um, assigned a certain gender at birth likely based on genitals. So a baby pops out and the doctor says, you have a girl, you have a boy. And so, you know, basically externally they appear to be one gender and they probably have those chromosomes of that gender. And over time, something they don't feel like that's the right gender. And we do now know that there's a biological basis for this. So we know that in brain studies, looking at how the brains respond in somebody who's transgender, it's closer to the gender, like with pheromone testing and looking at um, PET scans, um, they're, they're responding to things and their brain is functioning in a way that looks a bit more like the gender they're experiencing than the one that they were assigned. So I don't want anybody to think that this is just a flip of the dime decision. Obviously these people are really struggling. They feel like something is wrong often throughout their life. Some kids really do have a really strong predisposition and absolutely know at a really young age, like as young as four. So this is a real thing, but how we're managing it is really complicated. And so even just this year, 54 bills have come out in the US against transgender and, and against people competing either in sport or getting any kind of medical treatment if they're youth or even adult. So it's coming, this issue, the transgender issue is very, very um, relevant right now. Um, but I would argue, and I'll give you a personal, a personal, or personal take on this, I would say when we're talking about kids who are in elementary school, basically my daughter can outrun boys right now and she's nine, you know, and if her highlight of her sporting career is going to be what she did in, you know, intramurals in fourth grade, then I'm sad for her. So I think when kids are kids, we're not worried so much about the effects of testosterone and, and worrying about what's happening to a nine-year-old. I think we're going to have to put a lot more thought into what we're doing with people who are at the Olympic level. And, you know, is it fair for somebody who, like there's a New Zealand um, uh, weightlifter who's likely going to go to the Olympics and it will get a lot of attention, who transitioned um, when he became a she in his 30s and became Lauren Hubbard. So Lauren was competing as a male. Um, most of his life, and then Lauren became a woman, and I apologize, I jump around with pronouns, became a woman in his, um, in her 30s, um, taking testosterone suppression, but had competed in powerlifting this whole time, and then jumped into the women's category. And there have been a lot of people that have really um, pushed back on this because the transition was so late. So what we're really missing is studies in athletes to see what kind of effect testosterone have, is, has. Is it all about testosterone? If you have someone who for some reason transition when they were 14 or 12, they're gonna have a much different experience than somebody who transitions when they're 36. And I think as we learn more and we do more studies, we'll have a better take on this. But the problem is now we have to all make decisions and organizing bodies have to make decisions. And we have very little data in athletes. We know that if a, a transgender woman takes testosterone suppression very quickly. In just a few months, the hemoglobin level will drop to the level of a cis woman. But um, just in a recent review by Joanna Harper and others in BJSM, they demonstrated that basically looking at all the recent papers, and this wasn't even in athletes because we don't have much in athletes, um, people who are taking testosterone suppression, even up to three years, don't quite get their levels down to cis levels. Like they, they don't see the same, or they don't get the same decrease in muscle mass, the decrease in strength to get down to a, to a cisgender person's level. So it might be lower than where they started, but it's not necessarily equal when it comes to muscle mass 
and um, some function. So it's a complicated question, but I really think it's, it's an ethical one and it's a scientific one. And we have to partially weigh which is more important at which stage of development and at what kind of level of competition. Um, so I'll just leave it there and have others jump in on that. That's awesome. Oh. Um, Amadeus, I, so uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, um, I, I'm curious, I, I know you have so much to say. What is Denise, I'm, I'm curious what Denise is thinking right now. How do you think about, talk us through, how do you think through, should an athlete be allowed to compete based on what sex they were assigned at birth or gender um, or what, you know, how they, uh, you, you know, the, the sex versus gender um, argument, you know, or should they be allowed to uh, compete, uh, you know, in the, in the role that they see themselves in currently? So I'm going to set aside the harder question of transgender athletes. Um, because I have, I, I think I have to think more about that and learn more about it. However, the issue with um, Castor, for example, uh, the one thing I want to say is the way I want to frame this is morality and ethics is about voluntary human action, which is why things like doping get a lot of um, scrutiny, right? Because this is a voluntary human action that somebody wants to do, does to enhance their, their athletic performance, for example. Um, this um, hyperandrogenism is not ethical. It's not an ethics question in many ways. It is simply a natural occurrence that has occurred in certain people and not in other people. And in many ways, I mean, again, sometimes, sometimes ethicists can be helpful because we're not in the middle of it. We're standing a little bit out of it. And I would say, as somebody who's not particularly athletic, so is everybody on that track, right? They're all exceptional both probably just in terms of the, the graces that they got from, from physical prowess and strength and other things like that, not to mention all the skills and the training and the time and the commitment that they're putting in. So to me, they're all on the same playing field because they are all athletes. They are all of the same gender, right? And they're all comp competing and nobody made a voluntary human choice to to uh, give themselves an advantage. That is simply the natural variances of advantages that occur in the human, in, uh, among all of us, which is why I'm never gonna be on a track racing anybody. <laughs> That's fair. Um, uh, Amadeus, uh, Kate was talking about, you know, your, uh, your role with, you know, what is World uh, Athletics doing and um, how do you see this uh, issue being uh, laid out in policy and what's, what's the right way forward? Um, I, I, this is a, um, uh, a really, as uh, everybody's saying, a very tough issue uh, because at the end of the day, if the reason why there is an issue with, um, I'm using Castor, uh, is that she was good. If she wasn't so good, nobody would have cared. Um, and that's the underlying issue. It was the, the debate came in that she became the dominant in this, in the 800 um, and was um, uh, beating people who had been very good in the 800 for a long period of time very easily and she was making it look easy and so people started thinking okay is this she just came on the scene is this somebody who is doping um unnaturally and um the and again in full disclosure part of the um i was part of the committee who finally came up with the ruling didn't necessarily agree with all the things, but I was in that room and finally voted that, yes, this is how we're supposed to um, proceed. The thought is how do we make the competition fair? Um, uh, there was a um, uh, comparison of um, uh, Michael Phelps being um, his wingspan being so much larger than um, uh, anybody else's, 
him having maybe a little bit of webbing supposedly in his um, uh, between his um, hands that allowed him to swim faster than anybody else. Should that have dis, um, uh, dis um, uh, qualified him from being able to swim? I think where the World Athletics um, a board came down was in the genetics. Because the DSD had, was not an XX, there was an XY. Um, it wasn't just two X chromosomes, there was additional chromosomes. That was the reasoning and the, the reasoning and the rationale for saying there needs to be some kind of um, adjustment because that could be giving um, uh, an advantage. And yeah, it, it's, is it the right way to go about it? Is it discriminatory? Yes, they're discriminating against these athletes. But it's in allowing the athlete that has this additional um, uh, capability um, uh, and is able to compete. Um, and uh, that is something that other athletes in this same category um, wouldn't be able to do. And so that's kind of the thought process behind it. Do I um, uh, say that this is the right way to go about um, uh, policing and um, uh, categorizing? I, I can't say that, that, that I feel comfortable saying that, but something, it's the best that we can do right now, I think, and that has to be resolved, uh, has to be revisited and re-adjudicated and rehashed to figure out hopefully a better way to um, uh, make it fair for all that are involved. And um, in closing, I wanna also say that the scrutiny and the villainization that Castor has undergone is absolutely unconscionable. That, um, I think, is, there's no place for that. If you're talking about, okay, this is something that she did not do on purpose. This was how she was born. We need to take that and separate and not villainize her and say that she is trying to do, she was right, she always and still considers herself as a female. It was genetically, something is different, but that's how she identifies. How do we deal with that? That's a different question. Yeah. So tough, so tough. Um, what I would like to do at this time is just open the floor for any of our panelists to you know, share their thoughts before we go into like some Q and A. Nate, can I, can I say something real quick? you know, Kate and, and Dr. Mason I, for, you know, describing that so well, but I've taken care of a lot of transgender athletes over the years. And, you know, I own the fact that I, I knew them before they transitioned. So I just tell them when I mess up their name or their pronoun, I, I'm like, I'm so sorry. And they totally understand because you're listening. You know, when we talk to our, those athletes, there's a high level of mental illness and, and suicidality and they're less active. They smoke more. Um, you know, dysphoria is not healthy. Uh, Lucille Olinsky gave a great talk with Dr. Ackerman at AMSSM on transgender. If you have a chance to go back and watch it, please do so. You know, I think it's important to ask ourselves if it's evil to exclude people on race and exclude people on sex, why is it any different to exclude them based on, you know, this transgender topic? I, I, I feel like we are in a unique situation to support our, our athletes. And Literally, it can be life-saving just to let them know you're, you hear them and you care about them. And so I, I think, you know, we've had some suicides, you know, throughout the two decades of me being a sports medicine doctor. And I, I think we really have to own this issue. We have to be aware that our student athletes have mental illness issues. And in, if we just listen to them and respect who they are and tell them they have an ally, that can go a long way. I'm not saying we're going to save the whole world or change it instantaneously. But I think it's an important topic. And I know we're you know short on time, but I wanted to plug that because I think it's an important topic. Yeah, so that was spot on, Nat. Thank you. Anyone else have comments? All 
All right. Well, um, so I'm looking for our uh, for our thread, and um, I think our audience has been, uh, you know, enthralled in the discussion, but not asking a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to put myself in the head of a fellow for a minute, and um, just come back with a simple question of, so are we regulating hyperandrogenism or not? You know, what 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 do our fellows need to know? Uh, should um, you know? Should should they have to think about you know testing and what if one of their athletes you know is a female but looks you know built and muscular? Should appearances you know maybe is that something that our fellows should have to be thinking of? Is um, I know I'm introducing a separate t question there, but should should there be testing based on appearance? Um, I think it's it's important to know what the rules are at the level of play and where yeah. you're working. So, for example, every state now has a different rule and they're approaching these things differently. So in some states, if somebody identifies as a certain gender, they're allowed to participate in the sport category that they identify with, no questions asked up to, you know, th through high school. So in that state, you don't need to worry about it as a sports fellow. If someone says they're female or they say they're male, you're good to go. Um, I think you know at the NCAA level, if somebody is transgender, they need to take hormonal suppression to be in the female category, but the NCAA doesn't require a certain level. They just need you to have taken that suppression for at least a year. But in the meantime, you're allowed to compete in the male category. But after that year, you can compete in the female category and just have a doctor's note that says that you're still being treated, but no more questions than that. At the elite level, we're getting into specific categories. So world rugby has banned transgender participation um, because they're worried about safety and they've decided they're rank ordering topics. And so they put safety number one and they're worried about the physical issues in terms of a transgender person potentially having more power and potentially injuring a female player. So I don't think as a doctor, we have to worry about the policing. We need to know what the rules are and help guide our athletes to stay within the rules. And it certainly isn't our job to be detectives and say, oh, well, I saw this athlete on the field. And as the doctor, I think this athlete looks more masculine. So I'm going to go after him. Like there are enough people that are probably judging that person that we don't need to be part of that. That was awesome, Kate. I mean, I think we should just, uh, I mean, that was so well said, thank you. Um, you've clearly spoken on this um, a few times before. Um, so um, maybe one last question would be um, what, and this is broadening out back um, to our whole uh, notion of ethics in sports medicine. Um, what was a, um, a highlight or a, a situation from your career that, uh, went, that, that ethics stood in the limelight? What a challenging situation, um, one that may have turned out well or maybe didn't turn out so well. I'll go. Um, I, I was um, the, um, it, is, it was a return to play decision uh, that I uh, had to make for a, or a competency decision that I had to make for a um, uh, athlete who was um, uh, going to make a um, junior world championship track and field team. Um, and uh, there was a question as to whether or not uh, this athlete was fit to run. Again, this was uh, having people having overheard her talking about um, uh, this injury that, sh that um, uh, she had um, and her not having run and shown fitness. Um, and there was a question about should she be um, part of the team and be taken? Um, the thing that came into it was that there, one of her uh, parents was one of the coaches for the team that was going. And so we had that coach saying, yeah, she's fine. She should be able to run. And other people saying, well, the event that she's going to be running in, she's going to be running in an 
um, other people are going to have to rely on her. And this was, it was sat down, had to come up with a challenge um, uh, for her to do and prove her fitness um, or demonstrate her fitness. And it was something that I asked the coach, I said, well, what would you want to see her do to be, to demonstrate her fitness? And they said X and I said, okay, let's have her go out there and do that. And talked with the athlete and said, okay, do, and the athlete wanted to go, but in her mind was saying, yeah, I don't think I'm ready. This was a lot about the mom um, uh, coach um, saying we should go. Put her out there, had her try. She wasn't able to meet the standard. And we were able to say, look, we had something objective, did the fitness test, and we weren't able to do. But medically, she is not ready or able to um, uh, compete. Um, and we were still able to give her her kit and pack and everything like that. But that was something that was the falling back on, you know what, um, getting and communicating with the athlete, um, uh, getting an understanding of what the fitness level is or doing a fitness type test and using that objective measure to try to determine whether or not um, uh, return to play can um, uh, be done in spite of or despite the pressures from coach and uh, the uh, management wanting this to move forward. Thank you so much, Amadeus. Um, any other comments from our panelists? Well, I think that wraps us up. Um, we've, we've talked about a lot. We've covered a lot of ground. I wish we would have had more time. We clearly could have spent a lot more diving into all of this subject matter. Um, but um, thank you. And uh, in, in the biggest way, uh, thank you to each one of you, our panelists, for joining us, spending some of your time, sharing your, uh, your expertise with us. And uh, I know that, you know, despite... Uh, you know, this is going to be viewed many, many times on uh, on our YouTube channel asynchronously. We've got a relatively, uh, you know, small audience with us here live, but um, we appreciate those who have tuned in, uh, those of you who are tuned in live, and uh, we uh, we hope this has been a, a helpful and a informative session for you. Um, so uh, with that, we'll call it a night. And um, again, don't, remember, don't forget to uh, fill out our, um, the evaluation that, uh, that Andy Meyer sent out in the link. So um, thank you again and um, have a great rest of the evening.